Thank you everyone for coming today to see my senior capstone proposal presentation. My name is Lauren Muller and my topic is the art of persuasion. Um, so an overview of me as the creator of this project. I graduated from Honolulu High School back in 2011. Uh, a few years later, I went to HCC where I attended the MELE program and graduated in spring 21 with the Associate of Science in Audio Engineering. After that, I came to UH West Oahu in the fall, and my program of study is creative media with a concentration in general creative media. An executive summary of my presentation today. First, I'll start with my thesis statement and then move on to the objective and rationale of my research. Um, next, we'll do my plans for the senior capstone project and then finally address the significance of my proposed project with my research. So my thesis statement is a filmmaker must not only know their craft, but also have a good understanding of both psychology and persuasion if they wish to influence their audience to adopt a stance and motivate those viewers to take action. Um, the objective for um, my research was to explore models and theories having to do with persuasion and personality. And my rationale for it is that this knowledge can be used to craft a more persuasive message which is something that's very important for a documentary filmmaker. Uh, these are just four uh, things that featured heavily in my research this semester. And I just wanna quickly um, give a brief rundown of all these four things so that um, you guys can follow my line of thinking. So first, the modes of persuasion. Um, Aristotle wrote about these in uh, like over 2000 years ago in his treatise, which was called Rhetoric. There are types of rhetorical appeal. So the main three are uh, ethos, which is an appeal to someone's values or their morals. Pathos, which is an appeal to someone's emotion. And logos is an appeal to someone's reason or their logic. Kairos is the fourth one. Some people don't consider this a mode of persuasion, but um, other people do. It's the timeliness of a persuasive message. And then we have uh, Cialdini's principles of persuasion. They're sometimes called the six pillars of persuasion. Um, and these are six things that influence the effectiveness of a persuasive message. Uh, they are kind of self-explanatory, but I'll just go over a few of them. Um, liking, if someone likes uh, someone who's speaking to them, they're more likely to be persuaded by that person. We also have authority. If someone is an authority figure or an expert in a field, they're more likely to be persuasive when they talk about that topic and social proof because humans are social creatures. Um, we may see our peers doing something and think, hmm, if everyone else is doing it, then I should do it too. The elaboration likelihood model, uh, also known as the ELM, this is a dual process model which describes how individuals come to their decisions. So there are two factors in the ELM, their motivation and capacity. Motivation is someone's motivation to um, think about or care about an issue and their capacity is their, their cognitive ability, their mental capacity to actually um, meaningfully think about it. So if you have low values of uh, either of these, you're, um, someone is more likely to end up uh, in a state of lower elaboration. They're not thinking too hard about something. They're more just using simple cues and um, this forms an attitude that is quite weak. It can be easily changed and it has less impact on that person's behavior. Whereas if you have someone with high levels of both motivation and capacity, uh, that person is more likely to enter a state of higher elaboration. And um, these people will be using arguments to either support or deny whatever the topic is. Um, and I think it's interesting. They also put metacognition in this chart. Metacognition is um, thinking about one's own thinking. So basically this means that these people are challenging their own ideas and their own like closely held beliefs. And they're saying, um, is this really what I believe or is this really the right decision? Um, so uh, this sort of thinking, this high elaboration can lead to a strong attitude in the individual. And that attitude will be very resistant to change and have um, greater impact on their behavior. And then finally, I did wanna bring in um, analytical psychology into this because as my friends know, I'm very into um, like reading about, learning about archetypes of personality. So I referenced uh, Carl Jung's work um, 
analytical psychology is a, a term coined by him to describe his uh, specific model of um, personality. And it's sometimes called Jungian analysis these days. Basically, he argued that everyone has the same set of cognitive functions. Um, these functions are um, either thinking, feeling, sensation, or intuition. And these are four things that everyone has. And each of these functions will have either an introverted or an extroverted attitude. So an extroverted attitude of one of these functions will cause that function to look um, outwardly into the external world and also um, take into account objective data. Whereas an introverted attitude on a function will um, be more focused on subjective information, like uh, things that are personal to the user. So just a, a quick example, um, we'll take sensation and intuition. Someone who has extroverted sensation might be very tuned into their five senses, um, very aware of like physical stimuli. Whereas um, someone with extroverted intuition is maybe not as tuned into their their um, five senses and the things they're actually feeling physically, but they may be looking for um, possibilities in the external world because intuition is more so about the relationship between things, um, how things relate to each other, whereas sensation is more about the concrete. Uh, for my senior capstone plans, I'm planning to make a documentary addressing the Red Hill water crisis. Um, mostly because my family lives in Salt Lake, just about two miles away from where the fuel tanks are located underground, and also because I was born and raised on this island. And um, it makes me very upset that this is something that's happening. And um, also this kind of thing happens everywhere that the military goes, it seems like. So uh, this is a large undertaking. It's very unlikely the film will be finished by the end of spring semester but I'm planning to produce and deliver a trailer for the doc and also a work in progress draft, maybe just for Charlotte to see, not for public consumption. And the significance of my research, number one, um, nature documents, uh, documentaries can influence the behaviors of people who watch them. And also um, film as a medium is, uh, is very powerful and it can make people um, really think about the relationship between two different things. If you were to put images like these two um, back to back, it can prompt someone to really think about like, wow, this is a huge difference. And um, wow, what a consequence this is. Uh, some data for this point. Um, on the right side, we have a chart. This was a study I came across in my research where participants were shown eight minute clips of um, films. Um, on the right, these people were shown a nature documentary. And on the left, this was the control group. They were shown a documentary that had nothing to do with the environment. And after the screening was done, the participants were asked if they wanted to donate a dollar to a charity. And as you can see, the people who had just seen the nature documentary were uh, much more likely to donate to a pro-environmental charity. This is, um, these are both graphics from another study that I was um, looking at this semester. On the left side here, we have these three pathways um, that environmental films can enhance the human nature connection of a person or HNC. And um, it can also increase their pro-environmental behavior. And as you can see, the human nature connection will also uh, positively influence their pro-environmental behavior. If you look at the right side, this is basically uh, things that are in a film uh, structurally or whatever. This is um, basically how it how it how someone is processing it and this is the um, end result. So if we take this column on the right, um, a film with expansive landscape shots, charismatic fauna, ecological processes, and a focus on the connectedness and power of nature can inspire feelings of awe or the sublime within that person and make them reflect and contemplate what they've just seen. And this can lead to an expanded sense of self and a feeling of oneness with the world, which is this um, related to this human nature connection here. Next, the elaboration likelihood model. So um, this one, this study was about uh, people sharing uh, social media posts by the Chinese government about COVID-19. Um, and we could see the peripheral cues. These are those um, simple cues that people make gut reactions on that I was talking about before. 
um, people are more likely to share based on these kinds of uh, cues versus central cues are the ones that would require um, a higher state of elaboration in the person. And it's also interesting, you can tie this in with Cialdini's principles of persuasion. Um, social proof can be related to social media capital and also source credibility. It could either be someone's friend that shared a post and um, that's why another person will repost it or perhaps an authority figure like a doctor is the one presenting the video and that will also prompt people to repost without um, fact-checking it for themselves. And um, significance number three, so through research, it's possible to find out what arguments might be effective for certain sets of viewers. Uh, when I found this study, this was kind of a breakthrough moment for me in my research because I realized um, you can specifically target people and um, kind of craft a message specifically for the people you're most trying to persuade. So in this study, um, it had already been known from a bunch of other studies that people who are politically conservative have lower um, rates of pro-environmental attitudes. And um, the researchers for this study were wondering, uh, is there a way to, to get these people to, um, to care more about the environment? And they realized that if they invoke generativity, they can do that. Uh, generativity is the concern for future generations. And so um, political... Uh, politically conservative people, either because they're involved in the church or for whatever other personal reasons, they are more likely to uh, value generativity. And so the researchers for this study found that if, um, if someone is uh, making a persuasive argument that involves generativity, they are more likely to be able to persuade these conservative people uh, to take care of the environment. And number four, um, just an awareness of personality archetypes and preferences can help a uh, film appeal to a broader audience. So a filmmaker can take this kind of information into account and just kind of, you'd have to guess a little bit who the target audience is, who are those people you most want to persuade, and then kind of reverse engineer that and figure out what kind of people might these be, like personally, what kind of things do they enjoy? Um, so that's why I believe that... Um, this sort of knowledge, these personality archetypes can be useful in creating a film. And my target audience uh, for my documentary is gonna be Hawaii residents, military families, and I kind of cheated. I have two groups as number three, legislators or activists, because I'm thinking anyone who's involved with either like lobbying or um, you know the laws that we have in this state or this country, um, that would be useful if they saw it. Um, and my proposed solution is, of course, to use my knowledge of persuasion and personality to create a documentary film about this issue. So uh, my pre-production phase will be um, continuing my research. I did get some research on my documentary topic done already, but mostly I've spent the semester researching persuasion. Um, so I will continue that research. And uh, I also need to identify uh, more people who may be able to participate in the documentary as interview subjects and reach out to them. And I will also take what I have learned this semester about persuasion. Um, I'll take that information into account when planning out my documentary structure. And for the production phase, I'll be filming interviews, gathering footage either from archival sources or um, things that I'm shooting myself. And I'll also be gathering audio along the way for post-production, I will edit my documentary. Um, I'll decide if it needs voiceover. I would really prefer to have the interview subjects tell the story in their own words, but um, sometimes a documentary can be more persuasive with a narrator. It just depends what kind of content I get um, from the interview subjects. <clears throat> and then finally, I'll make and deliver a trailer of the work in progress film. And this is just um, a quick segment of a a film, a short film I made for Professor Farinella's class last year. Um, this is kind of what started uh, this whole idea of this being my capstone topic. There is a contaminated water crisis on the Hawaiian island of Oahu, impacting military the families. Red Hill mystery. Navy has Over a span of seven decades, it's estimated that more than a million gallons of jet fuel has leaked underground. 
Well, Paula, you know, the mystery is where did all that spilled fuel go? Fresh off a second tour Can of the military's the Red Hill fuel underground storage tanks, yeah. state and city officials are giving a sobering assessment. The military may not be doing enough to protect our drinking water. A single underground tank as high as the Aloha Tower and four times as wide holds 12 million gallons of fuel. 20 of these sit under Red Hill, and over time, 19 have leaked. A 2010 risk assessment study for the Navy exposed the risk of the city's halaba shaft, which supplies much of Honolulu's water. The water in my Hall's house is off limits. It smelled like I was pumping gas in my car. Hall and at least 1,500 other families in Honolulu, many military. Um, what's at stake really is the future of the drinking water supply for the island of Oahu, the most populated island in Hawaii. DOH is advising anyone who gets their water from the Navy to stop using it. That's, I cut it there because there's some weird shots right after that. Um, but that's kind of an idea of what I'm planning. Uh, I want to expand on this idea for my documentary. And well, there next, is a con next. Um, and again, I do want to incorporate archival footage. So uh, I took CM402 this semester, the archival research class, and I learned about all the amazing things offered by our Ulu archives. And I, um, in the course of working on assignments for that class, I came across a lot of footage that I would like to incorporate um, in my documentary. Um, things related to land use, land ownership, um, even Hawaiian sovereignty, uh, colonialism, capitalism. I feel like these are all um, kind of mixed together and related to this issue that's going on in our state right now. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you all for being here. Are there any questions?